uh, he's an uh, API expert and uh, author of uh, uh, an upcoming book, Design and Build Great Web APIs. Without further ado, uh, let me share the stage uh, for Mike and uh, share his uh, thoughts about uh, the topic. Thank you so much. Hey there, how you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. I was a little late to get in here, but we got it all set. It's great to see you. Good morning, Jakarta. I was just talking to Zubair before we started. I really wish that I could be there with you. Um, I'm in a little bit of cold, rainy climate in Kentucky in the United States. I wish I was with you in tropical Jakarta. But um, I'm happy to be here, and I'd love to get started with my talk. So let me just jump right into the talk and uh, yes. let you know this talk is about GraphQL, gRPC, and REST, oh my. It's kind of this idea of a unified method for designing things. I want to just tell you a little bit about the, the, the title of the talk. So it's really taken from the uh, movie uh, The Wizard of Oz, where they're uh, at this one point, they're through the scary forest, and they keep saying lions and tigers and bears, oh my. They're worried about all these monsters that might get them. And I know sometimes all of these things, uh, like GraphQL, and should I be using REST, or should I be using OpenAPI, or all these other things, sometimes get in the way, and they can kind of be like monsters to us. There's another great part uh, in the movie where they get to the, they get close to the to the to the witch's house is that this place that they're looking for, and it says, "I'd turn back if I were you." Well, we're not going to turn back. We're going to talk about the idea of using a unified uh, description model for all kinds of APIs, and I'd like to show you why I think this is important and uh, and how how we can uh, go move this stuff forward. So, uh, as Uber mentioned, this is me, Mike Amundsen. This is how you can get hold of me on. Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube. I would love to connect with you. I'd love to learn about what you're doing in the API space and how what challenges you have and how you're solving those challenges. So please connect with me uh, if you can. The material I'm, I'm presenting today is actually from the book that Zuber mentioned, uh, this Design and Build Great Web APIs, which is going to be released in October. It's in final edits. They're just doing the layouts and the pictures and things. And I'm, I'm really excited to bring some of this to you. So if you if you like what you see here, there's even more of this and more of lots and lots of other things in the book that you can uh, focus on. So what I thought I'd, I'd start by telling you a story, a story about uh, organizations. I visit lots of organizations that work on lots of APIs, and I see similar challenges along the way. So I thought I would give a story about API design and governments at enterprises. I've seen this happen at large organizations and small, and see if you recognize some of you in some of those stories. And then I want to talk about uh, this idea of HTTP-centric API design. Uh, what we do is we often use HTTP as our design platform, which is really kind of a bummer because it's an implementation platform. And we'll talk about why that's interesting. And then I'd like to show you one way that I think we can, we can solve this and do better. And that is a unified design that allows designers to work in design space without telling implementers what technology they use or how they're going to solve their problem. So let's start, start a little bit with this story uh, uh, about uh, design and governance. So um, this may sound familiar. Hopefully some of this may. Um, uh, we'll just see how it goes. So you maybe you're in a large organization. Um, you decide you need a consistent way to uh, uh, scale up your API community. You've got to do lots of designs. You've got to go start doing hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of APIs. So you need to make the design uh, some kind of centralized process, some kind of repeatable process that will scale across all your organization, which may even mean across the globe, from Jakarta to Europe to Africa to South America to North America, all over the world, we need this. So typically organizations that I, I see have done this, they'll, they'll decide that open API is really going to be the backbone of their practice. It's mature, it's well understood, there are lots and lots of tools. So it, um, it offers the sort of the common general guidance that people uh, so often look for. So they map out this holistic approach to API design. And one of the keys to all of this is uh, the tooling of the uh, open API platform. So, the, so I've had organizations that have created courses internally. Uh, they write guidance documents. They build a custom API editor, linter, platform, registry, some kind of thing. So you need to actually always work in this open API uh, ecosystem. 
They, some organizations even hire and train full-time API reviewers to make sure that you meet the standards, you follow the guidance, that it works inside the registry and all these other things. And that all works fine and that all works well and it scales and it's, it, it's moving forward until somebody wants to use GraphQL or asynchronous APIs. They want to use the async API platform. Uh, they want to use protobuf. All of a sudden, all of this stuff we've done with open API doesn't work with all of those other things. They have different description formats, different processes, different guidances, different uh, uh, structures that they need to manage. They don't always manage URLs, but they have to manage topics or they have to, they have to figure out how to, how to manage data models and so on and so forth. So what I see some organizations do is commit to duplicating another track. So they'll have GraphQL tooling and GraphQL linters and GraphQL registries and GraphQL training and GraphQL review teams. And then they do that for Proto and then they, they, they do that for gRPC and on and on and on. And that can be super challenging and that doesn't scale. Repeating it over and over doesn't scale and, and that's the real challenge. So what's happened? What have, what have we just experienced? It seemed like things were going well, um, but we ended up sort of on the wrong path. Well, what I think has happened is we've become very HTTP centric in the way we think about the design part. Not the implementation part, but the design part. And we need to get away from that HTTP centric idea. Well, what do I mean by that? So in most organizations, this HTTP is, is what you started with. You have HTTP based APIs. They're the simplest, they're, they're the most, most readily available. There's lots of training and tooling. It makes lots and lots of sense. But then HTTP becomes API space. There is no other API space. We, become, we uh, have this HTTP-centric implementation beginning. So we build all this structure up around it. And that means we have HTTP design practices. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, is what uh, the psychologist Maslow once said. So all we have is open API. All we have is HTTP. So we think that's all there is for APIs. So design elements of that particular protocol, uh, implementation elements of that protocol become the design elements. We design URIs, we design methods, we design headers and so on and so forth. So suddenly we're designing all these things and we're translating our customers' needs, we're translating uh, user stories and all these other things, persona stories into HTTP, thinking that that's a uh, design. Well, the thing is, we now have HTTP specific definitions of all of the things we're gonna do. We've defined URLs, we, this URL has a method, this action has a method, whether it's a post or a get or a delete or a put or a patch or whatever the case may be. And now we have a whole language that's built up around this. Open API is the language of APIs. The problem is we also have async API, protobuf, schema definition languages. We even have SOAP, lots of my, my customers have SOAP space too. So it turns out that we're missing an awful lot of things. We're not describing everything. We're not defining in a general way. So open API actually becomes a kind of a gatekeeper. You can't get your API released unless you have an open API entry in the registry. It doesn't matter that it's just a, 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 an impressed FTP endpoint. You can't get registered. You can't get secured. You can't get credit. You can't get approved until you have an open API spec. And we're now we're duplicating all sorts of efforts again. And the real trouble, the, this doesn't happen to everyone, but it sometimes happens, is it turns out design and review and all these things uh, start, to, start to break down. And it turns out we're trying to pigeonhole like that hammer. We're going to try, try to treat everything like a nail. You're not following the naming policy. Well, that naming policy doesn't matter. We're not using URLs. And it begins to slow experimentation. It turns out it's not really paying off to maybe try GraphQL, or it's not gonna pay off to go to asynchronous APIs, MQTT or something. So the organization can miss out on lots of opportunity if you become too rigid, if you become too centered on just this one style of APIs. So that's really the challenge. So how do we solve this? How do we actually come up with something that's gonna get us past this point? It turns out what we did is we built our process around open API. Many organizations do this. And that made sense at the time. What we need to do is think about building our process around a design 
specification that's divorced from the implementation specification. So I don't need to know about HEDP methods or MQTT topics or uh, data modeling for GraphQLs or mutations or anything like that. What I need to know about is the design. I need to translate my user story, my API story into a gen general design, you might say an abstract design, that can then be turned into implementation details by the, the developers once they decide what's appropriate. This API should be invented. This API should be a, a data model. This API should be REST. Let them decide that. So we need to use design methods that don't rely on HTTP as its elements. So we don't want to start with CRUD, create, read, update, delete, or start with uh, resource designs. We don't want to actually manage URLs or, or status codes or any of that other stuff. That, that'll be handled by our implementation folks. What we want to do instead, though, is focus on actions and properties. We define properties like given name and SMS number and, and all these other things that are the actual properties that we exchange back and forth. And then we want to focus on actions, like we want to do the input transform output pattern. So submit and approve and um, write and remove and move and all these things that we do, the real verbs of the, of the uh, domain. So this is why we have things like uh, design-driven languages like domain-driven design and things like that, because they create the languages. So we're going to design in the language of the domain, not in the language of, of some uh, protocol. Now, once we've designed in that language, we're going to need to write it down in a machine-readable way. And uh, what I like to focus on is the idea of an interface description language. Describe the interface. Not an interface definition language like an IDL, like an object model or things like that, but something a little bit more abstract that lets people create their own uh, actual definitions later. So a description, like I describe a chair, but it's not really the definition of a chair, right? So that's what we want to do. There are two of these uh, kinds of languages that, are, that have come to be used quite frequently. The Dublin Core Application Profiles, or DCAP, has been around since 2005. Uh, it's actually part of the RDF and ontology community, so it's used a lot in scientific uh, circles. It's used a lot in university and things like that, and it's used in some very large uh, organizations, medical organizations, scientific organizations. There's another, uh, a, a little bit more, more uh, simple, a little less verbose uh, format called Application Level Profile Semantics, or ALPS, that I and a few other people created around 2015. Actually, the first version was around 2013, but it was, it was actually uh, uh, kind of codified into a, a, a draft form for the IETF in 2015. And I'm going to show you an example of how to use that with a little tool that I have in just a minute. But there, the, the real idea here is to focus on describing your API in a generic way with properties and actions that then can then get in, uh, implemented in some other way. So we can translate things like ALPS into an open API definition or an async API, or a protobuf list, or a schema definition language for GraphQL, or so on and so on and so forth. So what you want to do is focus on the things that matter in your story, just like you always do, the, the properties and the actions. Write that into a machine-readable form so that it's consistent, so that everybody can use it. And then you can turn it over to the implementation group, and they can work on it. So hopefully, uh, that makes a little bit of sense. Let's look at some examples. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch over uh, to, my, to my command line and show you some examples, a little tool, and I'll show you some examples of the language. So give me just a sec here and come out of this here. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and make this uh, full if I can here. There we go. So this make it a little bit easier. So this is actually um, the uh, Alps uh, documentation. It is the ALPS document, and it's in a um, YAML format. So you can see there's a version. It looks a little bit like OpenAPI, but it's a little bit different. There's some metadata here that describes some things like a title and a starting root uh, location uh, and even uh, a, a URI ID kind of thing. And that's just some metadata. Um, remember we talked about uh, properties before, and this is a super simple little to-do list. I only, I only going to worry about two properties in this one, and that's going to be the ID and the body. Notice they're called semantic descriptors. They describe something. They, semantic is, is, is the idea of it describes a meaning. 
So ID means something to someone and body means something to someone. You can group these uh, uh, elements into, they're called groupings. You could think of them as an object or you could think of them as a struct. It depends on which language you're working in. But a, an item, a to-do item, is an ID and a body. If I was doing something very object-oriented, this grouping would probably also include actions, like reading and writing or, or updating or closing or completing or all sorts of stuff like that. So I do have some basic actions here. And again, we kept I kept it real simple in this example just so that we can sort of uh, focus on it. And there's, there's a, a, a thing called a to-do list, an add, and a remove. And you'll notice that each one of these has a type and then this one is called type safe, which means it's a read event. Um, this one is called type unsafe. Uh, unsafe means it's writable and it's not repeatable. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. And then uh, this is an item potent action, which means it, it changes something and it's repeatable. I could delete, for example, record number 10 20 times, and it doesn't matter. I'm only going to be deleting record number 10, right? But if I say uh, add a new record and I do it twice, I'll get two records, right? So that's the difference between unsafe and uh, item potent. But these are just kind of minor details. But what I've done here is I've actually described all the details I need, all the properties and all the actions in a single place. There are a lot more things that you can do with uh, ALPS documents, but I, I'm, I'm not going to get into that right here. You can find more in the, in the, in the repo that I'll share here in just a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit out of here. So we saw what that uh, item looks like, and I'm going to use a little utility called Unified, which is going to actually read in the, de the, the uh, description file and create a definition, right? So in this case, I'm going to read in the to-do, and let's say I want to create um, uh, the uh, schema definition language, right? So this will actually generate a proper schema definition language with a, just a super simple idea with um, the item. Uh, a query, a couple of mutations, and then there's just a wrap on, on the whole schema. And that's all I need to start feeding into tooling for GraphQL. Um, let's try this, clear this out. Then let's try a uh, proto, let's try a proto bug. Maybe I'm gonna use gRPC. So I can take the same document and start to generate a gRPC as well. So I get my parameters, my items, my responses, and then my actual service, which has the three RPC methods that we talked about that we needed before. And finally, since we're running short, I'm gonna do one more here. Maybe I wanna generate an open API. Now this one's a little bit longer because that's sort of what open API does, but this will give you an idea. Um, I've got, I actually even have a server if I was gonna use this for a mock, so you can include that. Uh, I have my to-do list and my ads. I have my components, I have my description, and uh, this version of the app will even generate sample data for you. So when you do your mocks and your tests, you have something as well. And all of that comes from this simple document. All of that just comes from this one uh, set of data. And, and it's actually really simple to use. And you can do other things. You can generate documentation from this, you can generate uh, diagrams, lots of other things from this same one document. So let's just wrap this up a little bit and then and then we'll have some questions here. So I want to go ahead and switch back. So pardon my uh, menu bar there. And come back over here. All right. So, whoops, here we go. I'm disappearing slides here. All right. So let's see if... Um, Let's think this thing through again. So this idea of breaking the, the, uh, the HTTP-centric grip, don't design using URLs and methods and resources. Don't use them as design millets. Use something else instead. Use properties and actions. Use a description language rather than a definition tool. And let your developers uh, create the definitions that they're going to need. Work on it in a format that allows you to translate that uh, generalized description that generalized design that can generate lots of things into a process of, of whatever the implementers want to use. Now you can use that as your registry. You can use that as your shared information between one interface and the other. And even if right now you're only using one format, so maybe, maybe you're only doing gRPC right now, if you adopt the notion of this uh, unified method of this a generalized approach, this abstract approach to description, if someone ever wants to add something new, you'll be able to do that without having to redesign and rebuild 
and retrain all of your people. So that's really all there is. I hope this gives you some ideas. Um, again, there's more in the book, uh, Design and Build APIs. Uh, you'll be able to uh, find uh, talk examples. This uh, link here will give you uh, the slides, the descriptions point to the repo, and you can find more on the YouTube channel as well. Hopefully that gives you some ideas and I'd be happy to talk a little bit. If we've still got some time, we can, we can take some questions. So uh, I'll uh, just switch over and uh, see if we've got any questions here. Okay, let's see. I'm not seeing okay. Maybe Zuber's got some. Hi, Mark. Hey, you so how much. you doing? I'm doing. Thank Absolutely. you so much for that uh, very uh, interesting uh, sh sharing about uh, a different approach where we have very much focused on the HTTPS methods. And then there cool. are other uh, interesting methods which we could use, a single method. We have an inter uh, qu interesting question from uh, Erwin. Uh, so she asked, yeah. what is the difference between um, as a, uh, using ALT as opposed to uh, using open APIs, uh, which uh, using open APIs through Swagger and Postman. I mean, are they similar sure. tools? Are they different, and how they are different? They're, they're similar, but they're different in one fundamental way. It, it was hard because I showed you it very quickly, but in yep. in the Alps document, there's no URL. Yep. There's no method. There's no status code. Um, there's no topic ID. Right. Those things get decided in implementation. So it turns out you can't successfully very easily generate code from the design document right but you could generate code from an implementation document from a definition right so the design's a little too general to actually generate code so what i'm really saying is use a design approach and then create a design document and then turn that into a definition document that belongs uh, to the builders so that is definitely a, a different approach um, but they they are very very similar in a lot of Interesting. Hopefully so that helps. Uh, is it safe to say it is a design first approach? Yes. Um, I, I often get a question Is there a way to uh, turn an Alps document or, or turn an open API into an Alps document? I don't, ha I don't have anybody who's written um, a, a tool like that because it's really this idea you just described of design first. Let's get the design, a document, and then we'll talk about implementation. I will say that Spring Tools uses the Alps format. Uh, and they do generate it from code, so they have a slightly different approach. Um, so you might you might you know, talk to the Spring Boot or the uh, String Data, String Spring Rest, that whole series. Uh, they're they're probably the biggest uh, purveyors of Alps right now, but they have a slightly different version. But I like the design first approach. Yes, that's interesting, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, just trying to see if there is uh, any uh, any further questions. Sure. Yeah. Maybe I talk too fast. Uh, that's, that's that's good. Okay. Good. Um, any any further tips? I'm I'm certainly looking forward for your uh, release of the book, and uh, of course we could get the pre-release version and and your, and your YouTube uh, talks on that. Uh, sure. So um, any further tips? Yeah. There's, I'll, I'll just say there's a whole chapter on uh, the Alps description format in the book if you wanted to learn more about it and, and how you can use it in various ways. Uh, and that book will be out soon. There's, there's a lot more in it. Um, there are some YouTube videos on Alps, I think. I can't remember where I am. There'll be lots of them there, but you can check that out as well. And I would just love to hear, I'll, be, I'll hang around for the event. I'd love to hear more from people. If you've got additional questions, uh, you know how to get hold of me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, YouTube, I would love to hear from you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for your talk, Mike. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good to see you, Zuber. Uh, goodbye to everyone, and bye -bye. I'll see you on the event. Thank you. Bye-bye.